Hey, everybody. All right. All right, the future of immersive realities, there it is again. And it's a fairly ambitious title, as Paul mentioned, but don't be scared. We're all going to get through this together. Even though it's big, this concept actually starts really small for me. Here's how the future of immersive reality started for me, actually. Now, first of all, I'm OK. That wasn't my blood. It was someone else's. Just kidding. <laughs> no, this was actually me attending my very first uh, extreme haunted house here in Los Angeles. And I really did not know what I was getting into. As a matter of fact, when I moved to LA, I started participating in a whole slew of inadvisable behaviors, including drinking unidentifiable liquids from strange people, getting in lots of white unmarked vans, <laughs> and signing my life away in email waivers. This basically just says, you're going to die in this. OK, great, cool. So why did I do it over and over again? Well, these experiences really struck me out of a stupor, and it reminded me why we create live experiences to begin with. You know, I had been to Sleep No More and Then She Fell, but with these shows in Los Angeles, the impact was somehow different. The tools of their trade were simple things, small things, fabric, fog, plastic, liquid, a guiding hand. With just these, they created an entire universe. And I'm going to throw a lot of names at you. I wish I could get into each company and what they do specifically. But for now, this high-level overview will have to suffice. Fortunately, most of you know a lot of the big names in immersive theater already. Sleep No More, as we've mentioned already today. And um, Tamara, the show that came to LA famously, it started in 1981 in Toronto. And these works include everything from Peter Brook's theories in 1968 all the way to the multiverses of Meow Wolf this year. And it's been flirted on and off with from the 60s through the 80s as these companies play with the notion of theater that goes without a proscenium arch, taking you into being surrounded by and interacting with their stories. And often, it's kind of been pre-label, actually in London, where they created a number of these experiences in sort of the misfit era. They called it promenade theater, which with shows like the company Shunt or the adorably named You, Me, Bum Bum Train, the whole purpose was exactly the same thing, to involve people in the story directly. Now, the giant of this field, of course, is Sleep No More and Punch Drunk. And even though Sleep No More is known for having started in London, then going to Boston, and then sticking around and around and around in New York, Sleep No More is just part of what Punch Drunk does. And they've actually been in the business since 2000, creating works based on the playwrights such as Chekhov, Shakespeare, Ionesco. They even snuck a little Doctor Who into the mix. And they know things about the small and the large. As a matter of fact, they are currently staging a show for just two guests over a course of six hours in London. Then we come to the other side of the coin in immersive theater, what I call the ugly little brother, the extreme haunted house. And these take the immersive theater techniques and add things like waivers, touch, uh, physical and psychologically demanding scenarios, I'll say. Uh, including companies like Blackout, Heretic, and Alone, an existential haunting. That's the name of one of the shows. And uh, these really are not amateur torture fests with no purpose when they're done correctly. As a matter of fact, people don't know this, but when 2009 rolled around and Sleep No More premiered in New York, so did Blackout Haunted House, which exemplified many of these traits. And the creators actually came from the theatrical background, seeking for a way to subvert theater in fun and somewhat disturbing ways. And when it's done right, the extreme side of this immersive coin is some of the most esteemed work in our field. You might not know, but there's actually a huge boom happening in immersive theater right here in River City in Los Angeles. And it's not just horror. We have humor like the John Stamos is my baby daddy show, and magic, uh, beauty, even therapeutic transformation. But what if, what if this new wave of immersive theater is a fad? How do we know that it has what it takes to last, like VR does? Sorry, like VR does. 
sorry, like VR does. Okay, so all joking aside, VR, just like immersive theater, has come and gone in waves as the experience technology has grown to meet the final creative. And often it's not because of the major things in design. Usually it's because we've just gotten better and better at the small things. With all of this immersive work and development, of course, there have been hundreds of discussions trying to define what immersive is. And nobody can really agree on where it starts or stops, leading to an outright existential crisis. For me, I never really cared about what the definition was. I always leaned on Justice Potter Stewart's famous quotation about pornography. I shall not today attempt further to define the kinds of material, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> really, for me, I wanted to figure out why we all got hooked on a feeling. Uh, I don't have the music, so you'll just have to hum it in your head. Just pretend. Cool. I also wanted to figure out why this young generation of them darn millennials were so into this stuff. Hey, you crazy kids, we're up here. Yeah, phones, you know. Uh, that's Brantley in the striped shirt, by the way. He's going to be important later on, I promise. There are powerful reactions from the visitors of these experiences. Things like this, I feel everything more, and it takes a couple of weeks for that feeling to go away. That's powerful, right? The creators in this stuff are in it for all different reasons, but it really swirls around that idea of getting people interested in something real. And screens are not a problem, but we should not underestimate how much people still are excited about elemental factors. The future for us, I believe, is built on how well we use the tools of technology and meld them with the tools of the real. Real things. We should be figuring out how to keep these strong and in the mix to help our guests remember that there is a real world to be lost in. Now, of course, there are only so many types of stories, but let's not overlook the foundation of what guests want to experience, and I call it primal storytelling. It's the body story. I mean, what else is our E experience in the SAID acronym but a story understood primarily by the body and not the mind? It's core to experiential entertainment in this mold, and it's going to become more and more vital. Now, I know for most of you, thinking of this stuff as a theme park designer, or themed entertainment designer, OK, that's great. How do I use all this magical, personalized interaction and extrapolate it over audiences of thousands an hour? Well, you'd be surprised to see how often this kind of personal engagement is actually within our grasp. It has less to do with resources or lack of resources and more to do with how we utilize and position our primal storytelling. With that in mind, whether you're a multi-million dollar theme park or an indie immersive theater show, I discovered uh, 13 small things that helped make the shows I encountered successful or unsuccessful in some cases, and usually at 1,000th of the budget of a typical theme park attraction, same thing with the schedule. They really all apply to audiences of nearly any size. So, number one, blood from a stone. Our creators in this ex type of uh, theater are super into the idea of featuring and not fixing, using their location rather than hiding it. And most of the creators that started to make this work use things like storage closets, their own apartments, garages, even U-Haul trucks. They used the things that were already present and the best of what already existed. Look, it's a scary haunted mansion. Yeah, don't do this. Um, <laughs> these creators really take the path of least resistance and prove that it's OK to uh, use the things that you already have in your physical location to set the show. Most of the creators that I know in these experiences will actually hold off in writing a script until they know specifically what location they're in and who their performers are. And that site specificity is really key to this kind of work. Scrutinizing audiences now look at everything that we do, right? And if the casing is part of that, why not make the casing part of your show? Number two, anticipation. Anticipation <laughs> is our next important rule. And there's real magic in it. It's comparatively cheap to capitalize upon, but uh, really, really effective. 
And some of the shows that work through this idea of how important and precious pre-show are uh, really have drawn the extended experience into the forefront of their works. There's a company called Nocturnal Fandango that has a show called The Sudden Loneliness Gift. And audience members can actually opt into different price tiers that mean they'll get a little bit more immersion in their day, anywhere from personalized phone calls to gifts and emails, even characters actually showing up at their real home, which I know not everybody's interested in, but there is an audience out there for it. That extended experience, setting things up before the visit and after the visit, has become more and more important to these immersive works. And it's really grown to the point where now we're looking at days, weeks, months, even years, that can be involved in all of the pieces of an immersive work, which for the big enthusiasts of this work is an exciting thing. It means that they finally have the opportunity for what they've always dreamed of, 24-7 immersion, which for some of you probably sounds terrifying, but there is an intriguing notion in the fact that it's kind of within our grasp now. Another part that crafts this extended experience for us are the motives of these creators, which again, have never been under more scrutiny. And most creators, knowing this, have decided fun ways to sort of muck with the idea of what's in-game or out-of-game in their productions. And the creators really love to blur these lines even more, throwing misinformation out there in a time when everyone knows everything. So. Who here has been the victim of an internet theme park rumor? Raise your hand. OK. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Uh, there's a show called The Lust Experience that actually has thrived in the land of the meta. And in that same way, they play on the idea of not knowing for their experience. Their writer, Clint Sears, actually wrote about midway through the pre-show of their experience. Darren and I have agreed to leave the project for a myriad of valid reasons that will have absolutely no effect on the quality of the show, and we remain as committed as ever to the lust experience that we now get to enjoy as fans ourselves. Now, of course, when they left the show, and I'm not insinuating anything, of course they, they left the show, but now that audience is cast into complete doubt. If the creators of this thing I bought a ticket for and I'm getting ready to attend have left, what kind of show am I in for now? All right, pop quiz, rule letter D. Does anybody know what rule letter D is? Anyone? No? You guys seem confused. Did you not know there was going to be an interactive portion to this experience? Yeah, rule letter number three is great expectations. So if our expectations aren't set up correctly, guests can have a real problem. And setting expectations is going to get more and more important as we get more interactive in the themed entertainment industry. Guests need to know what they can and can't do. And if your interactive rules change, that's OK. Let's say that the rules in a section stay the same from room to room or from scene to scene or are consistent across your experience. Can I talk to participants? Can I touch things? Can I move things? It's fine. You just need to commit and be ready to make all of your design decisions really focus and bring out that decision. That's right, public domain guy. It is confusing. Look, all right, I'm going to level with you. I am a dumb guest from roller coasters to escape rooms to immersive experiences. People who are otherwise intelligent like me, uh, we lose our brains when it comes to these experiences, which is totally cool, but you have to overcompensate. Ultimately, it's about establishing this new paradigms. Thank you, thank you. Yes, yes, sorry, I apologize. Uh, number four, <laughs> me, me, me. Um, sorry, I used your Facebook picture here. I hope that's OK. Uh, your hair looks great, so no problem. Anyway, uh, it's the age of Instagram. It's the age of social media. It's really the age of social media interacting and ceaselessly adapting to all of the things that it thinks that you like. It's a science. The science of me. And you've wanted to be part of that story ever since you read your first Choose Your Own Adventure book. I know everybody here read You Are a Shark. I don't even need to ask. Obviously, you did. Uh, but you wanted to be the hero. You wanted to be the, the villain. It's the Westworld promise, right? You want everyone to care about you. And you want it to happen in an exciting place you couldn't normally access. There is a little bit of a trick to this, though. And the immersive shows are knowing this more than ever. Which me am I? 
Am I me as a part, patron of your experience, or am I taking on an assumed role? Again, it's just like the previous rule. You have to make a decision and be prepared to live within that decision. Otherwise, guests that come to these experiences will end up very, very confused. While we're on that subject, as an aside, if you're going to go through an assumed role, maybe we should try to stretch the boundaries of these assumed roles outside of the typical trainees and recruits. This is a drawing of a typical theme park recruitment scene. I've had a child draw it to preserve anonymity, but let's be honest, everybody, we're all guilty, okay? <laughs> and for that matter, immersive theater has the exact same problem. About half of the immersive works that are currently in existence, the theme is you're in a cult. So then you've got your dual meaning and you've got your trusting the audience and, um, oh, Wait a second, I started at the middle of this slide. Let me back up again for a second just to explain. In medias res, in the middle of things, many immersive experiences start in the middle, just like a lot of themed entertainment attractions. And that's not accidental, of course. It's by design. It's primal and small, but effective. And it's been used beautifully for decades in the worlds of film, television, literature, Make me part of the story right away. I'll catch up. And this slide's meaning is actually a little bit of a double meaning. It means that we should be involving our participants right away and involving them up close and personal in the task at hand. It's all about learning how to trust our audiences. Now, we know that in all the attractions that we work on, there is a level of that trust, but there's a chance here to believe that our guests want to be thrust in the middle of a story and catch up and pay attention. And there's opportunities to continue to drive this feeling forward even more. Speaking of which, rule number six, I want to lose control, but not too much. So when you're on a theme park ride, you rarely feel like you're in danger, which is kind of weird in an industry where we're frequently being attacked by robots or falling off skyscrapers or flying to Mars. So why don't we feel endangered? Because even in the scariest moments, we trust the ride manufacturers to offer us fear without consequence. So we happily give up control. But some immersive creators have really decided to have fun with this and subvert that sense of control. And they've really learned in their works that even for a second, if we feel like we're not in control, we really, really enjoy it. Just as long as we trust the creators to return us back to where we started with our physical and mental well-being intact. It's all about smart programming. And again, just like that company Nocturnal Fandango I mentioned, uh, their works are about what they call spiciness levels. They actually use a questionnaire or an email to determine how much chaos people are interested in in their experience. And uh, depending on how high the spiciness level is for somebody, it shows how much they show um, the experience coming apart at the seams and really playing with that. It's also focused on the threat of impact because most of these creators know that the threat is actually a lot more uh, you know, engaging and exciting than the impact itself. Rule number seven, the live performer stands alone for now. The live performer is captivating, surprising. For right now, I believe the live performer is, has no equal, assuming that they're good, of course. Immersive theater has really found out and pinpointed how multifaceted these performers can be. They're way more than just someone who delivers dialogue. They are the stage managers and directors of their own scenes and moments in an experience. And uh, that impact can be brought onto the theme park world even more. For most of the hybrid attractions that involve one or two live actors, we have really only begun to stretch the surface of the incredible capacity these performers have. After all, they can impact hundreds of guests in one big conversation and then hone down a second later and talk to one or two guests specifically. They really do have an incredible range. And after all, uh, just like Danny mentioned with some of the performers and cast members in Pandora, people remember people. They look at the cast members and don't make the distinction between an operational cast member or an entertainment cast member. They really just understand how wonderful that live touch is. 
There are, of course, ways that we're trying to play with technology to simulate the live performer. And in virtual reality, um, there are hot tickets in figuring out the technical and operational challenges. So it's shrinking, but right now it's not quite able to replicate that human touch. In the same way, AI is trying so hard to simulate the subtleties of the human being, but unfortunately, very often that can plummet us straight to Uncanny Valley, which is uh, that place where simulated interaction just gets a little bit weird. Until we figure out how to fill and pave that in Uncanny Valley, we shouldn't underestimate the power of the live performer for thousands of minute and instinctive corrections, which are all evidence of training in reacting to and listening to a live person right in front of them. You know, I get it. All of our design tools are trying to figure out how to have the spontaneity of the live person without potential operational challenges, you know, feeding live performers, changing their litter. But in reality, um, it's an operational expense, but as our stories get more and more interactive, it's key to helping us feel like these experiences are really grounded. Speaking of which, number eight, touch the final frontier. A lot of the things I've talked about so far involve touch, so why bother? Why touch an audience? We all know about the potential challenges that can go along with touching a patron of your experience, but I would argue that when done right, touch and intimacy is an unbeatable shortcut to intense engagement and emotions. These participants in these shows aren't just shoved or carried. You'd be surprised at what they're doing in these shows. Uh, they've been smelled, uh, hugged, even kissed. Windows are the eyes to the soul. Well, or eyes are the window to the soul. The touch is the window to emotions. And we haven't really figured out a way to make all of this idea of touch totally palatable to the mainstream audience yet. Psychologically, the perspective suggests that maybe it could come at a slight remove at first with gloves or puppets. Um, there's also the way that touch is introduced, maybe gently at first, supportive. Think about our character meet and greets, where touch has been used for decades very successfully. There's also, of course, the tactile and haptic technologies. Maybe those are a way for themed entertainment to start to really bring touch into a mainstream audience and make them be able to appreciate it. Whatever the case, this particular element is dying to take part in the storytelling lexicon of themed entertainment. Number nine, I am a camera. So we become the dancer, we become the camera in this. And in a new generation of entertainment, this is really the way that creators are leaving their signature stamp on a story. A lot of focus is put in our industry on point of view and trying to think about how the guest is moving through your experience as the camera already. And of course, in virtual reality, there is a huge goal towards how do we give our guests a, a totally open world with complete agency. But we shouldn't forget that signature directorial leadership can actually be a really rewarding thing for both participant and for the creator themselves. When I went to Heretic's production, Vanish, a performer bodily moved me through a scene, covering and uncovering my eyes with his hand irising the scene as it progressed. And that attention to detail, that precision, treating me like the camera, that kind of removal of vision and control is sort of our chance at a new auteur cinema. All right, so here's our next test, everybody. What was his name again? Anybody know? Brantley? Very good. Uh, so now we move to a rule that, unfortunately, many immersive creators do not excel at. Immersive creators and writers, a little soapbox moment, we haven't been involved with your stories for as long as you have. You know, we've, you've been building these timelines of characters in your head for years combining and deciding how each character interacts with each other. And for me, some of the biggest achievements I've had in shows recently was that our audience members even remembered characters after the experience, sometimes long after. To be honest, though, even with that being a cool thing, a lot of times you can't underestimate KISS, keep it simple, stupid. Um, a lot of times our participants really only perceive some of that stuff, and we should be questioning how much needs to be in there. We don't want to overlook the power of pure scenario. Sometimes it's great to be sneaking through an environment or hiding from another character. That power in the pure scenario only is, needs a little tiny bit of character and story. 
sometimes it's actually better to not know. So steer clear, if you can, of the capital S story. There's really no room for blood feuds and family lineage in a three-minute teacup ride. <laughs> All right, number 11, pace yourself. This rule ties closely to the rules of the game I mentioned earlier. A ticking clock is hanging over every immersive experience, whether it's an escape room or not. And um, those tools of design need to focus on a clear sense of pacing. And pacing is useless if we, as the creators, understand it, but our consumer has no idea. Too often, the production team misunderstands what the pacing is going to be like for a guest, assuming that they'll linger in a scene that we didn't spend too much time on, or that they'll race through something that we figured that they would luxuriate in. And it's not really their fault. It's our fault for not using the tools of performance, lighting, sound, to dictate our pacing. A recent example that's been successful was Delusion's show, His Crimson Queen, which happened last year. They utilize two very different forms of pacing, uh, the overt and the subliminal. In the overt sense, they uh, literally had a voiceover track that announced act one and act two transitions, giving a really clear sense of where you were in the story. But transitively, our subliminal pacing involved nothing more than an hourglass in one scene to subtly amp up the uh, urgency of the moment and make people understand how they had to move through that space. It's really also being used in things like the chapters of experiences. These immersive shows are expanding out of just one live experience to multiple chapters. And in each chapter, they have their own distinct, carefully crystallized pacing that builds across the entire run of the arc. It's experience economics, basic rules of supply and demand, just with wizards, uh, cult members, and murderers. All right, number 12, It's Alive. So this is one I'm really excited to see uh, where it's going for both multi-million dollar theme parks and for scrappy immersive entertainment. The script and the experience are becoming living entities, and theme park designers are going to be needing to become more comfortable with using the programming language of games to think of how they script their experiences. And there are three emerging types that are really coming to the forefront in my mind. One are the loose scripted shows, which are like the tension experience depicted here, or have you seen Jake? And these experiences drive towards customization. They're loosely scripted, not in that they're not specific. They're very specific. But they leave room to insert moments, depending on how guests are reacting to the various parts of the show. Then you have your multi-scripted experiences, like capital W's, red flags up here, or the Speakeasy Society, where they'll write five different versions of a part of the script, and then hold them back and invoke a certain version, depending on how participants are reacting in the moment. It gives a really cool sense of spontaneity, like a spur-of-the-moment conversation, but it's really a magic trick. It's the if-then principle. And finally, we have our unscripted productions. And these have a stable amount of time that participants are immersed in the environment and stable elements like stable lighting, performance, audio. But then the performers and the guests are kept on their toes as the creators spontaneously react to guest choices and participant preferences throughout their experience, making it very spontaneous. It's that defined field with X feeling. It's basically improvisation like jazz, really, really scary free jazz. <laughs> Number 13, self-portrait of a tortured immersive artist. So when your audience looks at your experience's Facebook page or um, even the facade of your experience, what do they see? You know, the creators of these experiences are very complex in the motivations that drive them to create. They really want to do it all. And this can lead to a serious identity crisis. Unfortunately, when you try to do it all, you end up with a muddled mess of misaligned ambitions. When I hear that I'm going to be attending Southern California's top-rated, proto-immersive, site-specific, interactive installation, VR LARP ARG, a transmedia piece about death, politics, disassociation, and bacon, I end up <laughs> not being very excited about the experience because I don't know what it is. Think of it this way, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. You want to be a master, right? So resist the urge and keep your self-portrait clean. 
do we need to even categorize it all? Of course, it's a deeply human tendency. Uh, but as our experience lines blur more and more, and these experiences and what they do and what they look like become more blurry, really being strongly committed to your experience is what's going to help it feel unique. Because basically, when you try hard enough, everything is a proto-immersive, site-specific, interactive installation, VR, LARP, ARG, transmedia piece about death, politics, disassociation, and bacon. At the end of the day, the future of our immersive realities will have many ornate faces, but the mechanisms are surprisingly simple. So that's why I'm here today to tell you that even though the future might seem really far off, uh, the tools of it and the things that are mechanisms for us are many ways already existing, simple tricks that can wed the epic with the intimate. Like all rules, I invite you to break all of these. We're still figuring out the creature of engagement, which I think is why we all love it so much. It hasn't really been baked yet. What I learned when I moved into immersive theatrical design is that just like with theme park design, for all the big staging moments and awe and spectacle, it's truly built on a foundation of things like rules, pacing, subversion of control. So my plea to you all today is, don't be afraid to think of the primal, the small, the non-technical when you think of the future of immersive realities. Actually, we need these things more than ever. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, David. We have uh, time for a few questions before we move on to the next speaker. If you have any, oh, lots of questions. Please wait for a microphone. Hi, my name is Tria and I'm from USC. Um, I have a question for you. Um, so I've heard a lot of opinions, uh, different um, op opinions on immersive theater um, and concerns about different types of people with different levels of participation. And I've heard uh, the arguments on both um, of the constituents that like you should get all of your audience members to get up out of their seats and engage in the activities and some argue that we should like allow different levels of participation so that they will feel more comfortable within the environment. So what is your take on that subject? I, I completely agree. Um, one of my favorite things I've heard recently was about Knott's Scary, or Berry Farm rather, their Ghost Town Alive experience, um, where they said that it was an introvert's experience designed by introverts. So there's a reality that not everybody wants to be fully thrust into this stuff all the time and take on the role of answering questions and being put on the spot. For a lot of the productions I've been developing, we have played with just how you can, I, I think that the, the key thing is that these experiences have much more of a low bar of entry than people realize, and the people who are gonna like it the most are also paradoxically the most afraid to go into these things. So we are actively designing ways to sort of immerse, slowly immerse people in the experience by a recent show I'm doing right now. The guests actually have a bandana on, so they're not even being forced to speak or be part of the experience, their mouths are covered and they get to be involved in that world and move through it much like a dark ride, but there's not that pressure weighing on them that, oh, I have to really be a character and be in all this stuff all the way. Uh, I think we'll be able to stretch those boundaries more and more in coming years, but definitely for right now, I totally agree that our experiences should focus on not just the person who wants to be, I'm first right in line you know, with my fake sword pretending to fight all the bad guys. I'm also paying attention to the person back here who's got their arms closed, who just kind of is enjoying taking it all in. For me as a guest, it's just as important to stand back and watch and enjoy other people as it is to participate. Thank you. Sure. All right. Hey, how are you doing, Daniel? Hey. First person experience. Um, you know, defining immersive theater and, and, and your project, you have to, when you're marketing, you tell the audience what it is and what it is not. And that's very difficult in immersive theater. You either know what it is or you know, it's, you know what it's not. Um, but when people uh, arrive to your show, some people might have that expectation, uh, they, get a, they get experience different from their expectation. That creates mm. a, a sad face, right? So how do you guys overcome that in, in, in marketing? 
You know, I think that the, again, because there are no, no one of these experiences is exactly the same. So right now for us, there is a certain level of, of transparency we try to achieve. I think that the biggest thing is, from a marketing standpoint, is how you, it's not even just you're going to crawl on this experience or you're going to be masked or whatever. It's the adjectives and the way that you sort of bring people in. You want to start to involve them in that story. It's that extended experience thing. Even the process of deciding to buy a ticket uh, is part of that. So I think it has to do, for me, with the, the adjectives and the choice of words that you use to sort of say, is this a super exci you know, exciting? Uh, one of our recent shows, it said the guests were expected to participate. And I think that that gives people a really reasonable understanding of what it's going to be. And if it's a show that's more passive, and you're moving through interactive, immersive scenes, but not directly participating, I think the transparency is really important right now for us. Because eventually, we're going to establish different models. And people are going to say, oh, some people don't e even know. I mean, we all pretty much know what escape rooms are. But there are a lot of people out there who have no idea. I think that those models will start to really become deeply embedded. Until then, we have to really overcompensate and be prepared to over-explain what our experience is in our marketing material.